so as many hockey fans will know or uh, haven't already figured out, the Edmonton Oilers finished 29th in the league last season, during the 2015-2016 regular season. This was despite a huge step forward in changing of the management in terms of the general manager and the head coach, drafting Connor McDavid, and making some key acquisitions at the tray at the draft and during the offseason. Many of the failures of the Oilers was a result of a number of things, but probably none more important than the injuries. Today, I'm here to talk about the injuries that the Oilers experienced and how it impacted the team the way it did. So, as most people will tell you, and as everyone knows, hockey is a sport. And in any sports, no matter what it is, whether it be football, soccer, baseball, basketball, uh, whatever, injuries happen. Injuries are a thing. Injuries will and can, can and will happen. It's not uncommon for players to go down with an injury. However, being hockey, and being the sport that it is, hockey has so many different injuries that can occur that it can affect the time period of a person's recovery time. So, let's talk about the injury situation. <clears throat> the Oilers led the league in manned lost games due to injury at 368 regular season games. That means, so that is from game number one at the beginning of October to game 82 in April. 368 regular season games were lost. Manned games were lost due to injury. That's number one. If you go to the NHL.com website, we look at stats. Stats here. Uh, teams. Do they have one for injury? I'm looking at this one here. Or penalties. Edmonton Oilers, regular season. Dubai. Fort. Enhanced. Okay, they don't have one for injuries. Season all time. Okay, anyway. The Oilers led the league in man lost man games lost due to injury at 368. Also, they had the most number of impactful injuries on their team. Meaning two things. Number one, they had the most injuries of any team this season and they had the most number of significant injuries by any team this season. Now, teams, now, as I said, injuries are a thing in any sport, and hockey is no exception. In fact, an argument could be made that hockey has the most number of different injuries that can occur to any number of players at a certain amount of time. Here's the thing, though. Normally, teams that get an injury generally don't feel the results because they mostly have the depth to overcome that injury. A team that does not crashes and burns. And the best example I can provide of this is the Montreal Canadiens, who just became the worst team in the NHL this year alone when Carey Price went down with an injury. The fact that the Montreal Canadiens lost so many games after Price was injured just shows 
that a key injury to the team, to a key player, can really put you in trouble. Now, how does this relate to the Oilers? Well, because on some nights where an injury occurred, the Oilers did have the depth to overcome the injury. At the same time, however, they also struggled when injuries occurred. But before we get into that, let's I have a list here of the name, number of players that were injured, the number of games they and the number of games that they missed. So, during the preseason from October 8th so during the regular during the 2015 preseason, the Oilers were six and zero in their seventh six and zero in after playing six of eight preseason games. In game seven against the Vancouver Canucks, Jordan Eberle goes down with an injury, goes down with a shoulder injury, and he ended up missing thirteen games from October eighth to November third. Then on October eighteenth. Matt Hendricks goes down with a foot injury, and he missed seven games, returning on October 31st. Then on October 21st, Griffin Reinhardt went down with an undisclosed injury, missed six games, and returned on October 31st. Then on October 27th, Justin Schultz went down with a back injury, he missed 14 games, and came back November 27th. This injury wasn't as bad because, as we all know, Justin Schultz isn't a good defenseman. And many of you will probably argue with me that, hey, Justin Schultz just won a Stanley Cup with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Guess what? He won a cup with the Pittsburgh Penguins, not the Edmonton Oilers. It's been proven when a team, when a player leaves the Oilers, they become better. Look at what happened to Brizgalov. Look what happened to Dubnik. Look what happened to Cogliano. Look what happened to Brodziak. Look what happened to Mark Arcabello. Team, players that leave Edmonton become better and is because the management system in Edmonton over the past six years was absolutely atrocious. Now, back to the injuries. <clears throat> On October 29th, Rob Klinkhammer went down with an undisclosed injury and he missed 21 games coming back on December 14th. On October 29th, Lori Korpakoski went down with an undisclosed injury, missed eight games, and returned on November 14th. Then, on November 3rd, 2015, Connor McDavid went down with an injury that was later described as a broken, broken left clavicle, and he missed 37 games returning to the ice on February 2nd. The injury was occur now the if you go to the Oilers website and look at their injury uh, report the dates will say for McDavid's injury November 6th to January 23rd. This is because I'm guessing that the diagnosis for broken left clavicle came down on November 6th and he was officially cleared for full contact hockey on January 23rd. He went down with the injury in no on November 3rd in a 4-2 win against the Philadelphia Flyers, and he came back on February 2nd in a 5-1 win against the Columbus Blue Jackets. And that was 37 games missed. Then, on November 8th, Matt Hendricks went down with an undisclosed injury, missed three games, came back on November 12th. Then, on November 12th, Benoit Puglia missed, the, missed one game due to an illness. Ryan Nugent Hopkins missed uh, one game on November 14th with an illness. Luke Gazdix missed two games with an undisclosed injury from November 18th to November 20th. And then on November 20th, Andre Sequeira suffered an illness as well, resulting in him missing one game. Then on November 27th, Neil Yakupov was tackled by a linesman. And I say tackled because if you look on the replay of that game, which was, I believe, against the Detroit Red Wings, Neil Yakupov is on the right-hand side of the face-off dot at center ice when a linesman for some dumb reason, grabs onto Yakupov and hauls him down. 
He had a high ankle sprain, and he missed 22 games returning on January 12th. Then on December on December 2nd, Brandon Davidson uh, suffered a dis undisclosed injury, missed two games, returned December 4th. Then on December 2nd, and as well on December 2nd, Benoit Pouliot suffered an undisclosed injury, missing eight games, returning December 17th. Then on December 6th, 2015, Andrew Ference um, uh, had hip surgery done, uh, which ended his season, missed 55 games after only playing six. Then on December 14th, in a game against the New York Rangers, which was also the night that the Oilers honored and r raised the banner of Glenn Sather, Oscar Clefbaum went down with an upper body injury. Actually, it was a broken finger because uh, I think Ryan, uh, one of the Rangers' skates blades went up. It was a broken finger and then became an upper and lower body injury. That was it for him for the rest of the season. He missed 52 games and he never played the remainder, obviously, end of the season. Then on December 17th, Rob Klinkhammer went down with a foot injury, missed six games, came back on December 29th. On December 21st, Brandon Davidson went down with an undisclosed injury, missed four games, came back on December 29th. Then on New Year's Eve, uh, both Eric Griba and Iro Pakarinen both uh, suffered undisclosed injuries, with Eric Griba missing one game and Iro Pakarinen missing three games, returning January 4th. On January 18th, Glory Kor Korpakoski suffered a lower body injury, and missed three games, returning on the uh, January 21st. On January 19th, Ryan Nugent Hopkins blocked a shot against the in a game against the Florida Panthers, I believe. Was it the Florida Panthers or the Tampa Bay Lightning? Um, I think it was the Florida Panthers. Anyway, he blocked a shot with his hand, suffered a broken hand, missed. 21 games returning on March 10th. Then on January 23rd, Brandon Davidson suffered an undisclosed injury, uh, missing two games returning February 2nd. Then on February 2nd, Justin Schultz suffered from an illness, missed a game February 16th to February 18th. Zach Cassian had the flu, missed two games. Then on, fair, on February 18th, I don't know what game... The Oilers were playing, but Eric Griba suffered a knee injury, so uh, and he missed the remaining 24 games of the season. Then on March 1st, in a game against the New York Islanders, a 3-1 win for the Oilers, by the way, Benoit Pouliot took a hard hit from uh, from one of the took a hard hit into the boards from one of the Islanders players, suffered a shoulder injury. He would miss the remainder of the season, missing 18 games. Then in a game against the Colorado Avalanche, Brandon Davidson goes down with a lower body injury, misses the remaining 14 games of the season. On March 12, Matt Hendricks uh, suffers a undisclosed injury, misses a game. On March 12th, uh, Adam Party uh, suffered a hand injury, missed nine games, uh, returning on March 28th. Then on March 22nd, Patrick Maroon had an illness, missed a game. And then on March 24th, Ryan Nugent Hopkins uh, uh, suffered a mild concussion, missed three games, returning on March 28th. So, <clears throat> for those of you who weren't counting, that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, let me uh, think I may have screwed that up. <clears throat> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. The Oilers suffered 33 injuries this season, some to repeat players, some to players for the first time. And in the midst of those 33 injuries, four, sorry, five of those players suffered season-ending injuries. To say the least, 
This is painful. The fact that the Oilers suffered this many injuries in one season alone shows the amount of trouble that this caused for the team. Not just the fact that there were key players like Brandon Davidson and Oscar Clefbaum going down with injuries, but the fact that the Oilers couldn't maintain any momentum they had. Here's the thing. Remember back when I said that the Oilers had the num most number of impactful injuries? This is what I'm talking about. And let's get this going. On October 8th, during the preseason, the Oilers had to play eight preseason games. And they played four opponents. The Calgary Flames, the Arizona Coyotes, the Winnipeg Jets, and the Vancouver Canucks. Edmonton won both games against Calgary, which was a split squad game, both games against Arizona, and both games against the Winnipeg Jets, resulting in a 6-0 record with two games remaining in the preseason. At that point, the Oilers had a six-game winning streak, and then in the seventh game of their preseason schedule, Jordan Everly goes down with an injury, doesn't return until Connor McDavid goes down with an injury. So... That's one bit of momentum the Oilers had going for them. They, really, they won six straight, and then Eberle goes down with an injury. Now, am I saying that if the, Eberle hadn't gone down with the injury, the Oilers would have won all eight games? No. I'm just saying that it kind of was inconvenient when the Oilers won six straight preseason games, which is the first time I've heard of the Oilers doing that, and one of their star players goes down with an injury. Then, on November 3rd, Connor McDavid goes down with an injury. Keeping in mind that at the beginning of the season, for the first 13 games of the season, the line of Benoit Pouliot, Connor McDavid, and Neil Yakupov was the hottest line in the NHL at that time, and McDavid goes down with an injury. He misses 37 games over a span of three months. And then... In December, the Oilers won five straight games, and Oscar Clefbaum goes down with an injury. Now, they won six straight in December, and then crashed and burned at the start of the second half. Yeah, it wasn't good to be a fan. Uh, but basically, Clefbaum got injured, Oilers were winning five straight, they won six straight, crashed and burned, they stopped. And you can see the pattern developing. Now... To the forward core, I don't think the injuries were that bad. Yeah, injuries to Yakupov, Eberle, McDavid, and Nugent Hopkins were crippling to the Oilers. But considering they also had Taylor Hall, Mark Letestu, um, uh, Korpikoski, Hendricks, Pakarinen, Lander, Gazdick, Dreisaitl as well, uh, Yakupov, uh, Pouliot, the fact that they had those guys meant that the forward core wasn't really damaged by the injuries of McDavid, Nugent Hopkins, and everybody. Yeah, they were missed, don't get me wrong. It's not like the team said, oh, everybody's out, well, we're not going to miss him, and it's going to be all fine and dandy. Out of the oh, those three injuries, uh, McDavid's was probably the most crippling, especially since of the three players, he missed the most amount of time, I think. Um, Nugent Hopkins, let's see when... Okay, so Nugent Hopkins, he missed a game. Nugent Hopkins, Nugent Hopkins, he missed 21 games. Yeah, no. Uh, McDavid alone missed the most number of injuries from the three, from Everly, Nugent Hopkins, and himself alone. It was the defensive side of the game where the injuries were the most impactful, in my opinion. Uh, and here's the thing. One of the law... Here's the... One of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about the Edmonton Oilers, especially this past season, was that they had no defense. That was certainly true for the past six years that they had been rebuilding. Rebuilding. This year, though, the Oilers had the strongest defensive core I have ever seen on this team since at least 2009. You had Andre Sakara, who signed a six-year, $33 million contract in the offseason last year. You had Darnell Nurse, who was called up and absolutely proved he deserves to be in this league. Brandon Davidson was an up-and-coming young defenseman who was great. Oscar Kleffbaum was great as usual. 
Uh, Eric Greibo was great. Uh, and out of uh, Andrew Ferentz, uh, yeah, he only played six games, so I can't say anything about him. But the point is, even just these three guys alone, Nurse, Sakara, Griba, um, um, uh, Davidson, and Clefbaum. I think there was, an, I think I said another guy. The Oilers generally teams use six defensemen in a game. That's three lines of two of two pairings. And with the injuries that the Oilers encountered, they had to call up Griffin Reinhardt first, then they had to call up Jordan Osterley, and then they had to have Mark Fain, and then they had to uh, acquire Adam Party or claim Adam Party off of waivers. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that the injuries to the defensive core really kind of didn't help the Oilers' case that this defense sucked. Now, don't get me wrong. Osterley, Reinhardt, Nurse... Uh, and admittedly, Fane actually did a pretty decent job manning the Oilers' blue line when the injuries to uh, Griba and Oscar Clefbaum and Brandon Davidson uh, crippled the defense of the team. Uh, Sakara was great, Nurse was great, and as I said, the other guys played well too. But the problem with that is it doesn't matter if they played well or not. The problem was the injuries... It caused the Oilers to give the big line minutes and big NHL time minutes to young players. Players such as Leon Dreisaitl and Darnell Nurse would be better suited playing sheltered minutes in the National Hockey League, but because of the injuries and admittedly the lack of veterans on the team, forced the Oilers to call up these guys and say, hey, you know what, Dreisaitl? Nugent Hopkins is injured. You're going to be playing on the top line with Taylor Hall and Teddy Purcell, at least for the first half, and I don't know who took his spot in the second half. Uh, I think it was Korpakoski, maybe Pakarinen? Yakubov? I don't know. You said Drysaddle, you're going to play top line minutes with Taylor Hall and Teddy Purcell, and you're going to be great. And Drysaddle was. So, <sighs> what does this mean? So, what do the injuries show? Well, if anything, it shows that the Oilers are actually a good team. YouTuber, uh, Leafs fan, YouTuber, Sportsnet writer, and employee Steve Dangle made a video about a few months ago where he was talking about how much the Oilers were sucking. In fact, he started the video off like this. Making a video about how much the Edmonton Oilers suck would be the easy thing to do. Trust me, it's what I plan to do with today. About a decade of futility, the only thing they seem to win is the draft lottery, and then they get slaughtered 5-1 and then 8-1 on the weekend. If futility was football, they would be playing the Leafs in the Super Bowl. And then I would go, all right, let's take a look at the Oilers' contracts this season and how they're playing and compare it to last season. And, the, and is it just me or the Oilers? Actually, not that bad. That's how he started that video, and he made a completely legitimate point. Because of how everyone has seen the Oilers play over the past few years, because of how much the Oilers have not been a good team in the past few years, all outsiders looking in look at the record and go, yeah, they still suck. The fact of the matter is, people who don't take a look at the roster, don't take a look at what the heck is going on with the team outside of the rink, outside of playing a game, don't realize that the amount of injuries were a big reason why the Oilers meh, are were not that good at the time. At the time that he made the video, the Oilers were tied for last place in the National Hockey League, and they were about to play the Toronto Maple Leafs in Rexall Place. By the way, <laughs> Connor McDavid got five points in that game, just, so, just to rub it in, guys. But the point I'm trying to make here is that people who don't follow a team, and don't get me wrong, I understand. If you're not a fan of the Edmonton Oilers, you don't need to follow them. You don't need to look at the team and go, hey, I think I'm going to follow you because I don't like you. I understand. You you like a team, you're going to support your team, you're going to follow that team the most. But what I really don't like is that when people make a judgment, uh, judgment based on the Oilers' record. And as another YouTuber and fellow Oilers fan, Ryan Robinson said in one of his videos, what he likes about some things like stats is that they don't lie. 
you can say whatever you want about stats. You can say they they were rigged, they were put wrong, whatever. But at the end of the day, a stat does not lie. And if you don't think that the stat is right, maybe it's because your opinion isn't right. So basically, here's what I'm saying. People took a look at the Oilers' record, and they saw that the Oilers finished with 31 wins, 43 losses, 8 overtime losses, finished with 70 points, and they were second last in the league this year. If they looked at the record alone without having any knowledge of what happened to the organ, to the amount of injuries or anything like that, they would go, well, they still suck. I guess no improvement was made. Oh, there goes typical Oilers. Well, <laughs> hey, at least we all know that the NHL is going to give them Austin Matthews in the draft. Mm, I hate it when people do that. Here's the thing. Perhaps you should take a look at the injuries. Because if you were to take a look at this list, and I will link this page in the description of the video if you want to take a look for yourself to know I'm not lying about the injuries, look at them yourselves, look at how many, how many end of season injuries the Oilers had, especially two of them in December, and then tell me that the Oilers record was really as bad as it seems. Because I'll tell you what, right now, if the Oilers didn't have as many injuries, they probably would have finished with a better record. And I know people would like to call me a homer for saying that. I'm a homer when I say that. I'm pretty sure Ryan Robinson himself will call me a homer. I'm not saying that the record, if the Oilers didn't have any injuries, they would be a playoff team and they would have won the Stanley Cup. I am saying that the fact that the Oilers suffered so many key injuries and so many injuries overall, it hurt a lot of the potential that the Oilers had this season. Keeping in mind that the Oilers had the best first half of the 2015 of a season this year alone than they had in the previous six years. They were they had they were four and they were four and seven in their first eleven games. And I know what you guys are thinking. Oh, four and seven. That's like a typical Oilers start. Keeping in mind the first seven games, the Oilers were like 0-9 and two last season in the first 11 games. In fact, in the first half of last season, the Oilers won only 9 of 42, 41 games. 9 of 41. 9 of 40... Well, actually, no, I think it was first half they actually played 30. Because it was 21 plus 9 is, is 30. Yeah. 33 games into last season, the Oilers only won 9, and they fired Dallas Eakins. Same result this time, different game thing, but in the first half of this past season, the Oilers won 17 games. Say what you will, but they were 17-21-3 in the first half of this season when they were 9-21-3 and three last season. So... <laughs> What does this mean for the Oilers next season? What is going to happen to the Oilers barring a few injuries and barring many injuries? Well, <sighs> barring a few injuries, Oilers make the playoffs. I know a lot of people are going to see that kind of as a weird statement considering that it's the Edmonton Oilers we're talking about here. But the management system of Todd McClellan and Peter Shirelli as head coach and general manager respectively made this team better in just one year. Look at, and again, look at what they did. They they drafted Connor McDavid, obviously, but Shirelli, in the offseason alone, went out and addressed the th two most important things that the Oilers needed, goaltending and defense. So barring a few injuries next year, I'm saying that the Oilers make the playoffs, barring as many, if they have as many as this, I'm not saying they're going to have 33. They might have more. They might have left less. But if they have as many injuries as they did with net, as they, if they have as many injuries next season as they did this season, it's going to be another tough year for the copper and blue. So that is it for this one. Thank you guys so much for watching. Leave a like or subscribe if you guys are new. Tell all your friends. Comment in the section. Uh, let me know in the comment section below. If you did take a look at this and 
let me know two things in the comments. First of all, if you didn't know the Oilers' injury struggles this season, and if you're and if you were of the opinion by on the Oilers' record alone that they sucked, and basically, I'm gonna I was complicated. Basically, here's what I want to know. A, if you were aware of the Oilers' injury troubles this season, and B, if you weren't aware of the Oilers' stru injury struggles, and you took a look, and you had a look at how many injuries they actually did have, if your opinion of the C of them changed. Let me know, and I'll see you guys next time when I talk about what I think the Oilers are going to do in this year's offseason. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.